it's the same old story of the rich guys creating something that'll be good for them and not so good for all of us. In 1910, Senator Nelson Aldridge summoned New York's most powerful bankers to an island off the coast of Georgia to secretly negotiate plans for an American central bank. Traveling under false names in a private railroad car, the great secrecy of this expedition would foster conspiracy theories for decades to come. The Federal Reserve is not actually a lending operation. It's a fiat printing press. It is an illegal monopoly on the power to counterfeit fiat paper as U.S. dollars. It is an unconstitutional and therefore illegal monopoly on the power to counterfeit money into existence. A power that has of course been unconstitutionally granted to the bank's owners by the traders in Congress. The reason this is all true is because the bank does not possess the money that it lends, but simply counterfeits it out of thin air. Tell me how do you lend to others that which you do not actually possess yourself to lend? The Federal Reserve has the power to create money. If you or I run the printing press in our basement, we're counterfeiters. When the Federal Reserve runs the printing press, the electronic printing press, it's monetary policy. Here's the thing about the Federal Reserve. It's not federal, and there is no reserve. Every dollar in existence is owed to someone else, and not only that, but all the money in circulation is owed back to the Fed with interest. The problem with that is the money to pay the interest doesn't exist. It's never been created. This means that the Federal Reserve System is not only designed to keep us down, but also to keep us going down. The value of the dollar has been declining since the establishment of this fraudulent monetary system in 1913. And by 1971, it was clear the dollar could no longer be exchanged into gold. Finally, President Nixon, in front of a television camera, bumping, I think, gun smoke off the air, um, Bonanza. Bonanza will be shown after a special report from NBC News. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. For the first time in history, the dollar was just a piece of paper, backed only by faith in the Federal Reserve and its policies. Over the next decade, the cost of living more than doubled the dollar lost more than half its value. So, what's going on here? Why does the Constitution clearly state that our money shall be coined, yet we are using government-issued, supposedly official, paper dollar bills? And we can't even redeem these for silver any longer. And why does Thomas Jefferson, the very man who drafted the Declaration of Independence and co-authored the U.S. Constitution, warn us about banks and corporations. Something is off here. The notion of a central bank uh, does not uh, fit into the Constitution. Uh, the Congress has the authority to coin money and only gold and silver should be legal tender. And uh, this is an absolute contradiction of the Constitution to have a Federal Reserve system and a central bank. Do you feel that our paper currency should still be backed by gold or silver? I'm not really sure what you mean. Um, like change the color of our money or something? Or It was designed for uh, the elite. And even today, a lot of people don't quite understand that. The Federal that. Reserve System, to most people, seems like it is a agency of the federal government. That's what I thought it was when I first started to research this topic. But it turns out that it's nothing of the kind. The Federal Reserve is a hybrid organization. It's a partnership between the federal government and the private banks. When you look at it deeper than that, its essence is neither as a government agency or a private company. In reality, it is a cartel. In other words, it's no different in essence than a banana cartel or a sugar cartel or an oil cartel. It's a grouping of the large private corporations in the field, banking, who have come together to create agreement between themselves to limit competition, to preserve their profits, and to make sure that 
no newcomers come in and uh, take away their position. That's what cartels are always designed to do. And it's a shocking thing to realize that something as prestigious as the Federal Reserve System at its core is nothing more or less than a banking cartel with exactly those same objectives. We have a statute that doesn't square with the Constitution. It's void. It is not a law, in fact. So the question then arises, well, how does that square with the oath of office of representatives, senators, judges? And the answer is it doesn't. That when they come face to face with a statute that is contradiction of the Constitution, they are to treat the Constitution as the supreme law and treat that statute as void. So that's number one. Here we have a system, Federal Reserve System, that has all of these constitutional problems and everyone is essentially looking in the opposite direction. So that doesn't square with the oath of office. And one would think that the president, being the head of the executive department, in which we find the Treasury, the Department of Treasury, right, which interacts quite closely with the Federal Reserve, might have something direct to say about that. And then, of course, the President has a specific constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, and the supreme law of the land is the Constitution. So you would expect, on top of all of this, that he would be saying, wait a minute, if the Constitution doesn't square with the Federal Reserve Act in one or more ways, then I should be giving directives to the Secretary of the Treasury to take certain kinds of action to deal with that. And, of course, we see exactly the opposite. I don't think it's good policy for the president or a president-elect to second-guess the Fed, which is an independent body. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. What should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? What the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. The Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Today's paper currency, far from the gold and silver coinage stipulated by the founders, is essentially created out of thin air. Most people are alarmed when they hear about the fact that the Fed can create money out of nothing and charge interest on it, so they don't have the money to repay the loan. So what do they do? Easy, borrow some more. So this process goes on and on and on, and that's why we have the national debt growing and growing and growing. But we have to pay more for a bag of groceries today than we did five years ago. It comes out of our pocket, it comes out of our earning capacity. That is value which we should have, but it's been taken from us through a process that we call inflation, but in reality, it's a hidden tax. Inflation is the result of being able to create money out of nothing. And that is the power we have given to the Federal Reserve System. Looking at this chart, it doesn't take a genius to see where we are headed. And when this system crashes and burns, from the ashes will emerge the new world order. This has been the plan all along. Set up a system, get us to be dependent on it, then by the time it inevitably fails, they will present a solution. The final solution, Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new order for the ages. Where this graph is headed is for total destruction of our monetary system. Our money will be totally worthless and it'll probably be reissued in the form of some international currency, which will be equally worthless. But the value to these people is that once it's on an international basis, there's nowhere else to go. Right now, if you, if you don't like American dollars, you can buy uh, Japanese yen. If you don't like that, you can buy 
uh, Swiss francs. If you don't like that, you can move to whatever currency seems to be having a little better track record. Once there's an international monetary system in place, modeled completely and exactly after the Federal Reserve System is exactly the same, then there's no place else to go, folks. The New World Order is exactly what it says. A single order for the entire world to live under. One authority to answer to. A one world police force, a unified world military, and one kind of currency for everyone. They even want to implement a one world religion. Just do a quick search for the United Religions Initiative, which states that it's a global grassroots interfaith network that cultivates peace and justice by engaging people to bridge religious and cultural differences and work together for the good of their communities and the world. And that's the thing, they make it sound good. Peace, justice, unity, community improvement. What's not to like? Well, they don't tell you the rest of the story. They fail to mention the part about a worldwide conspiracy being orchestrated by an extremely powerful and influential group of genetically related individuals, at least at the highest echelons, which include many of the world's wealthiest people, top political leaders, powerful Jews, and corporate elite, as well as members of secret societies, including Freemasons. Freemasons run the country! And the so-called black nobility of Europe, dominated by the British crown whose goal is to create a one-world government, stripped of nationalistic and regional boundaries that is obedient to their agenda. Their intention is to obtain complete and total control over every human being on Earth and to dramatically reduce the world's population while regulating and managing reproduction thereafter. Folks, there is a new world order that's being created. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective a new world order can emerge. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order. It is a big idea, a new world order. Such is a world worthy of our children's future. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. And that's why I wanted to speak to you today about the new world taking shape around us. About the prospects for a new world order now within our reach. I'll be talking in some detail about the possibility of a new world order. The quest for the new world order. New world order. The new world order really is a tool for addressing a new world of possibilities. The President George Bush has talked time and time again about the new world order. So it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. A new world order, a defining moment in history. New world order, new world order, new world order, is that a new world order? True new world order. Build a new world order, new world order. I've told you before, because I love it so much, they also created the great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Thecorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. Creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. What it really is, is putting the American economy under international regulation. Yep. And those people who have been yelling, oh, the UN's going to take over global conspiracy government. Theorists. They, conspiracy theorists. They've been crazy, but now they they're right. Those conspiracy people had said and suggested that for That's years. Right. You're not wrong. International regulation of the financial institutions, which is going to happen under the IMF control. Now, I risk sounding like a conspiracy theorist, but it's no longer a theory. What I'm about to say is fact. The secret organizations of the world power elite are no longer secret. They have planned and are now leading us into a one world communist government. The combining of national governments started with the European Union. That union started with trade agreements, then a common currency, the Euro, and now a European Parliament that is feverishly passing laws that uh, override the laws of, of the member nations. 
A constitution was drafted but rejected by a few uh, of those nations, but never mind. They implemented it anyway. Now it's North America's turn. Building on the North American Free Trade Agreement, the NAFTA section of the Commerce Department is busy drafting laws and regulations for a North American Union, a union of Canada, America, and Mexico. The President has attended secret meetings and signed at least two agreements under the Security and Prosperity Partnership Program. Today we must develop federal structures on a global level to deal with world problems. We need a system of enforceable world law, a democratic federal world government. On the outskirts of the National Capitol today, black limousines with darkened windows converged on a hotel where private security guards imposed ironclad control. The limos carried royalty, political power brokers, and industrial titans to a secret meeting that will last all weekend. It's known as the Bilderberg Group. Could their objective be world domination? It is impossible not to reach the conclusion that the non-reporting of these events is anything other than a conspiracy between the organizers and the media. It merely confirms the belief of many that the hidden agenda and purpose of the Bilderberg Group is to bring about undemocratic world government. It's a disgrace that the European Commission is colluding in that. CFR members include America's wealthiest tycoons, as well as the highly placed elite in government, academic institutions, tax-exempt foundations, and the establishment media. Ruling Class Journalists, written by Richard Harwood, describes the CFR membership as the ruling establishment in the United States. The Washington Post article boasted that news reporters who are CFR members do not merely analyze and interpret foreign policy for the United States, they help make it. Who are these policy makers? Many of their faces are familiar. NBC's Tom Brokaw, CBS's Dan Rather, ABC's Barbara Walters, Jim Lehrer of PBS, William F. Buckley of National Review, media mogul Rupert Murdoch, owner of the giant multifaceted News Corporation. These media heavyweights, and many others like them, are members of the CFR. Powerful corporations are also invited to become members. At the close of the 20th century, CFR influence presided over far-reaching consolidations of media control. In 1995, CFR members Michael Eisner of Disney and ABC's Thomas Murphy merged their media empires. Soon after the merger, the Disney-ABC empire becomes a CFR corporate member. In the year 2000, the world's largest internet service provider, America Online, joins forces with Time Warner, one of the world's largest news organizations. The CEOs favoring the move are CNN's Thomas Johnson and Time Warner's Gerald Levin, both CFR members. Once again, another media giant is created under the shadow of CFR influence. Today, an elite handful of individuals define the agendas that are supported by the empire of establishment news. What sort of a financial deal should Obama be seeking to strike when he travels to China next month? No, I think this would be the time because you really need to bring China into the creation of a new uh, 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 world order, financial world order. Uh, they are kind of reluctant members of the IMF. They play along but they don't make much of a contribution. So I think you need a, a new world order that China has to be part of the process of creating it. While the name New World Order is a term frequently used today when referring to this group, it's more useful to identify the principal organizations, institutions, and individuals who make up this vast interlocking spiderweb of elite conspirators. The Illuminati is the oldest term commonly used to refer to the 13 bloodline families and their offshoots that make up a major portion of this controlling elite. Most members of the Illuminati are also members in the highest ranks of numerous secretive and occult societies, which in many cases extend straight back into the ancient world. 
The upper levels of this tightly compartmentalized Illuminati structural pyramid include planning committees and organizations that the public has little or no knowledge of at all. The upper levels of the Illuminati pyramid include secretive committees with names such as the Council of Three, the Council of Five, the Council of Seven, the Council of Nine, the Council of Thirteen, the Council of Thirty-Three, the Grand Druid Council, the Committee of Three Hundred, also called the Olympians, and the Committee of Five Hundred, among others. In 1992, Dr. John Coleman published Conspirator's Hierarchy, the story of the Committee of 300, where he summarizes the intent and purpose of the Committee of 300 as follows. A one world government and one unit monetary system under permanent non-elected hereditary oligarchists who self-select from among their numbers in the form of a feudal system as it was in the Middle Ages. In this one world entity, population will be limited by restrictions on the number of children per family, diseases, wars, famines, until one billion people who are useful to the ruling class, in areas which will be strictly and clearly defined, remain as the total world population. There will be no middle class, only rulers and the servants. All laws will be uniform under a legal system of world courts practicing the same unified code of laws, backed up by a one world government police force and a one world unified military to enforce laws in all former countries where no national boundaries shall exist. The system will be on the basis of a welfare state. Those who are obedient and subservient to the one world government will be rewarded with the means to live. Those who are rebellious will simply be starved to death or be declared outlaws, thus a target for anyone who wishes to kill them. Privately owned firearms or weapons of any kind will be prohibited. The sheer magnitude and complex web of deceit surrounding the individuals and organizations involved in this conspiracy is mind-boggling. Most people react with disbelief and skepticism towards the topic, unaware that they have been conditioned to act that way by the institutional and media influences that were created by the mother of all mind control organizations, the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations. It's in London. What most people believe to be public opinion is, in reality, carefully crafted and scripted propaganda designed to elicit a desired behavioral response from the public. Mind control is a much greater problem than most people realize. According to Cisco Wheeler, a former Illuminati mind control programmer, there are 10 million people who have been programmed as mind controlled slaves using trauma based mind control programs with names like Project Monarch and MK Ultra. The newer non trauma electronic means of mind control programming that grew out of the Montauk project may include millions more. Al Bellick, who played a principal role in the development of the Montauk project, said that there are likely 10 million victims of the Montauk-style mind control programming worldwide, with the majority located in the USA. He also said that there are covert Montauk programming centers in every major city in the US. After seeing what I've seen in my lifetime, and doing a few years of research, it's hard for me to doubt these claims. Also, I recommend a documentary called The Montauk Chronicles you'll gain a much clearer understanding of mind control programs. In fact, I encourage research of everything that we've gone over here today. I could go on for days about the New World Order. There's just so much to it, and not to mention all the things happening now that are taking us straight there. False flag operations, shooting hoaxes, perpetual wars, mass media propaganda from the six corporations that own everything you see, hear, and read, an education system destined for failure, presidents that are selected, not elected, GMOs and other terrible ingredients like high fructose corn syrup, MSG, and artificial sweeteners that get placed in most of the food supply, vaccines and the countless prescription drugs that the pharmaceutical industry floods us with. So many people are all messed up from this stuff. Behind all these things are the same perpetrators, banksters and Illuminati gangsters, 
Their goal is to make our world extremely unbearable and chaotic so that they can offer the ultimate solution and fully implement the new world order. This has been ODD TV, and I appreciate you watching. We got some dumbass motherfuckers floating around this country. Dumbass motherfuckers, you know? And this ain't just ranting and raving. This ain't just blowing off steam. I got a little evidence to support my claim. It's fucking embarrassing. Only a nation of unenlightened halfwits could have taken this beautiful place and turned it into what it is today, a shopping mall. And how do the people feel about all this? How do the people feel about living in a coast-to-coast -coast shopping mall? Well, they think it's just fucking dandy. Millions of semi-conscious Americans, day after day, shuffling through the malls, shopping and eating, especially eating. Americans love to eat. These people are efficient, professional, compulsive consumers. It's their civic duty, consumption. It's the new national pastime. Fuck baseball. It's consumption. The only true, lasting American value that's left, buying things. The big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They got you by the balls. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. They don't want people who are smart enough to sit around the kitchen table to figure out how badly they're getting fucked by a system that threw them overboard 30 fucking years ago. They don't want that. You know what they want? They want obedient workers. Obedient workers. People who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to passively accept all these increasingly shittier jobs with the lower pay, the longer hours, the reduced benefits, the end of overtime, and the vanishing pension that disappears the minute you go to collect it. And now they're coming for your social security security money. They want your fucking retirement money. They want it back so they can give it to their criminal friends on Wall Street. And you know something? They'll get it. They'll get it all from you sooner or later because they own this fucking place. It's a big club and you ain't in it. The game is rigged and nobody seems to notice. Nobody seems to care. That's what the owners count on, the fact that Americans will probably remain willfully ignorant of the big red, white, and blue dick that's being jammed up their assholes every day. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned and we'll see you back next time.